Richard Harvey was a uh, medical missionary. He wrote a book called 70 Years of Miracles. And uh, he told a story in that book about a time when he was a student at Allegheny College in um, Meadville, Pennsylvania, I believe is where that university is, in the 1920s, late 20s, and I think he may have graduated sometime around 1930 or something like that. And it was med school, he's in medical school, and he said something happened every year um, around Thanksgiving. That, that last class in a chemistry lab um, had a, there was a, there was one last class in a particular chemistry lab that had a uh, sort of an infamous moment every year in that first lecture, that last lecture right before uh, they would go home for Thanksgiving break. And it was so popular that this particular professor, whose name was Dr. Lee, uh, would pack this lecture hall every time this particular day rolled around um, every year um, at that university. It was a huge hall. I mean, it was kind of maybe you know, built kind of like this. It was uh, built more like an auditorium where the, uh, the, 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 the floor would be down here and he'd have a desk that he would come around and stand in front of and all the students would be packed into this lecture hall that would seat about 300 students or so, but it would actually have students standing along the, for this one particular lecture, students would be standing along the, the walls and up in the balcony area and even sitting in the aisles because everyone would come in anticipating wondering what would happen. Would this be the year, finally, that someone would challenge Dr. Lee? Well, what this lecture was about was this. Dr. Lee would stand up in front of this, this group of students this humongous, in this humongous lecture hall, and he would say this. He would say, Thanksgiving is a time when many of you are going to go back to your homes, and you're going to gather with your families, and you're going to have this great big meal, and before you partake in this meal, you're going to do something that everybody calls giving thanks. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna bow your heads and you're gonna to begin to pray. And you're gonna to pray to a God that you believe is there, that you believe is listening to you, that you believe can hear what you're saying, that you believe will answer things that you say, that you believe, some even believe, talk back to them. And he says, so what I want you to do is this. He said, I, before you go home and you begin to do this really ridiculous act that, com that comes about every single year at this time, I'm going to invite anyone in this classroom right here today to pray. And what he would do is he would grab a glass flask from the table behind him in the chemistry lab. And he'd walk around out in front of the chemistry table there and they would stand on this concrete floor. And he said, what I'm about to do is I'm going to drop this glass flask onto the floor. And if there's anyone in here who actually still believes in prayer, believes that there's someone listening to you and believes that that person, that God will answer you, I'm going to invite you to pray that this flask will not break when it hits the ground and see if your God will answer. Richard Harvey said that that professor had been given, Dr. Lee, that professor had been given that lecture for over 15 years by the time he was at that, at that university, by the time he was a senior. He said he remembered when he was a freshman, he remembered that everybody talking about the, you know, the, this famous lecture that he was going to give, and he anticipated that day, and he thought to himself, would I have the bravery as a Christian to stand up and say, I'll pray? And he said, that day came and went, and I didn't. He said, I was scared to death. He said, and then it came again my sophomore year. My sophomore year, I didn't have to take the class, but I went anyway. And everybody would go, would pack in there anyway, and they would listen, and no one challenged him, but no one challenged me. He said, by the time I had become a senior, there was a freshman on campus who came to me who knew I was a Christian also, and he said, Richard, I know about Dr. Lee's lecture, and I know about his challenge, and I intend to stand up and pray, and I'm asking you if you would pray with me. This was in September, the beginning of the school year. And he said, let's begin praying right now that God would answer this prayer, that God would end this ridiculous lecture that's been allowed to go on year after year after year, that he would show his glory and that he would somehow keep that flask from breaking when it hits the floor. Richard Harvey said that he was astonished at this freshman's faith 
at his resolve that he would do this. And so he said, sure, I'll, I'll pray with you. Because he thought to himself, I'm not going to stand up on that day and pray. This kid's going to be out there on his own, but I'll pray with you leading up to that day. And so he did. He said day after day, they would, they would just get together for a little bit in lunchtime. He said every day they committed that at some point they would just gather together, stand together somewhere on campus, in their dorm, wherever, and just pray that God, when that day comes, that God would answer this prayer. And so finally it came. Thanksgiving uh, was, was here, and it was the last class of that freshman course uh, before the, the holiday, and all of the people were packed in there. And this time, there were even more people in the hall than normal because word had gotten around that there may have been a freshman that this year was finally going to challenge Dr. Lee and his quest. So Dr. Lee stands up, and he begins just like he always did. And he said, Thanksgiving is a time, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, if there's anyone here in this lecture hall who still believes in prayer, I invite you to stand up now and pray to your God that this flask will not break. Now I want to stop there and I want to ask you a series of questions. And you don't have to answer them out loud, but just think about them in your mind, if you would. Think about how you would truly answer them if you were standing in front of someone and they asked you to answer these out loud, what would you do? What would you have done if you were there in that moment, in that room, with almost 400 other students in that university, and even some professors standing in there, watching, listening? Let me suggest that, that whatever you would or wouldn't have done may say a little bit about what you believe in your deepest part of your heart about prayer, about the effectiveness of prayer. Let me ask you this question. What do you believe about prayer? Again, don't answer out loud, but just think, think, what, what, what is it that you believe? Do you believe, let me, for example, do you believe that things actually happen on earth because someone prayed to God in heaven that it would happen. And because someone prayed, something happened on earth that maybe would not have happened that way had they not prayed. Do you believe that? Could prayer actually change the course of human history at times? Is there anything that doesn't happen in the world that would happen or might happen if people would pray. Some challenging things to think about. I mean, if you don't, and, and I guess the next follow-up question is, if you, if you don't believe that any of those things really, if you don't believe that that is actually the case, that, that anything really would happen if you don't pray, then I guess my question is, why pray? Why bother? Why, why, why even involve yourself in this thing that God asks us to, to do, to pray? I mean, suppose you decided today. I mean, just let's say you decided today. I mean, we've spent four weeks now giving you practical examples of, of how you might be able to spend some time with God in prayer. You've got, you've got now 52 ideas, so a different idea every week for a year to actually spend time with God in prayer. So let's just say that, that, that you decide this morning that for the rest of this year, you're going to take that challenge and every single day starting now, you'll start with... Idea one this week, and you're just going to go with it this week. Maybe you tried and you failed already. We're four weeks in. So just start all over and say, okay, I'm going to do this. And you decide and you commit, I am going to pray for the rest of this year. How might your life be different come May or June or July, October this year? Actually, let's, let's reverse that question. Let me reverse that question, and let's ask it this way. Let's say you decide today that you're not going to spend a minute in prayer. That you're not going to pray one single time for the rest of this year. You're not going to say a prayer. You're not going to bow your head. There will be no prayer for you for the rest of this year. Now let me ask you, how will your life be different in May, June, August? Will you, will you notice any difference? 
would there be any difference? I guess the question I'm asking is, have you been praying? Does your life, is your life an, an example of conversation with God? Is that who you are? Does prayer really do anything? Is it really any good? Is it really worth it? Now, I want to tell you that I believe that those answers to those questions that I asked, I asked several questions there, probably five, six, seven questions or so, and I want to tell you that I actually believe that those answers are yes, 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 and yes, and yes, and yes. I don't know how many yeses that was, but I believe that all the answers to those questions are, in fact, yes, that prayer really does. God does hear prayer. God does want you to pray. God does say that you have not because you ask not. You realize that? In James chapter 4, it says, you don't have, I think it's 4, verse 2, or 2, verse 4, but in James, read the whole book, find it. It says, you don't have because you don't ask. Now, what does that mean? Does that, I mean, I, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean the opposite. It doesn't mean, I mean, because some of us, you know, we, we know that God sets things into motion. This is such a mystery to us. God sets things in motion. He has a plan, and His plan will not be thwarted. God knows what's going to happen. God, God ordains what's going to happen. Yet He says to you that you don't have because you don't pray. You don't ask for it. So in some way, in some miraculous and mysterious way, even though He determines the ends, He wants you to be used as the means to that end. I'll tell you what that verse does not mean. It doesn't mean the opposite. It doesn't mean it's going to happen anyway if you don't pray. So, so don't pray. You're going to get what you don't ask for. <laughs> I do believe that God will accomplish His purpose some other way. But He wants to involve us. He wants things to change in your life. And so He wants you to ask. He wants you to ask. He wants to move things around in your plan, in your life, in your path. And He wants you to ask. He wants you to pray. God does answer prayers. Courses of events in the world are changed because of prayers. Things happen on earth because people pray. And people's lives would be very different if they prayed every single day. Don't just take my word for it. I want to show you in the Bible. I want to take a quick little journey from the beginning all the way through the Old Testament, and we'll even land in the New Testament and read some verses to conclude this. So let's just start in the book of Genesis chapter 15. Now I'm going to paraphrase a lot of things here for the sake of... of, uh, of time, and if you would like to write these these chapters down, these, these books and chapters down, you can certainly go back and read the stories in a bit, because all I'm going to do is give the high spots of some things that happened in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 15, a man named Abraham was called by God, and God told him in this chapter he was going to be the father of many. He's going to be the father of many nations, and he would have a son. The problem was Abraham and his wife Sarah could not have children. She was very old, and she had not been able to have children, not been able to conceive. They had no child, and God actually gave them a child at 100 years old, All right, when he was 100 years old. And so what happens is that in order for Abraham to be the father of many nations, then not only was he to have a child, but that child had to have children, and those children had to have children, and so on and so on and so forth. And so Isaac, that child of Abraham, had to have a, a wife. And so Abraham sent a third party, a servant of his, to go hunt for Isaac, a wife. And, and so I'm skipping now from 15 all the way down to Genesis 24. And in Genesis 24, do you know how when, you know, hundreds of miles away, this servant goes and he searches for Abraham, uh, Abraham's son, Isaac, a wife. And the way that this wife was found, do you know how this wife was found? Through prayer. Abraham said, pray to God, and this servant prays to God. And as he's praying, Rebecca appears. Try that. Right? <laughs> Never thought about praying, right? Go to clubs, whatever, you know? No. Pray. Pray. Exodus chapter 2, the next book over. Famous guy. Many of you have heard of Moses. 
Moses was called by God to help the Israelites get out of bondage, to get out of slavery in Israel. And uh, all of a sudden, they were, you know, before that ever happened, before Moses comes, in Exodus chapter 2, it tells us that the Israelites were doing something. They were doing something. They were praying. They were groaning, it says. They were groaning, but they were groaning out to God about their circumstance, about being in slavery. And they were saying, how long is this going to be? We need to be set free. And so they were praying. And what happens? God answers their prayer. He sends Moses. And so later on, we see in Exodus 14, as Moses is called to take the people and lead them out of bondage, out of slavery, they are running from the, uh, the Egyptian army and they come across the Red Sea and they get to the Red Sea and they are now they're they're now stuck. There's a barrier there. What's going to happen? They're going to be arrested again. They're going to be brought back and put into slavery. No, you know what Moses does when he's faced with this, this, this ocean that's in front of him, when he's faced with this impossibility that's standing there, instead of saying, well, there's not much we can do about this now. We just got to see what's going to happen to us because there isn't any way we can, can, we can't change this circumstance. We can't control this. You know what Moses does? He prays. He stands up and he prays. And God does an amazing thing. He parts that sea and they walk right through. The next chapter over, Exodus 15. They go, they're out in the desert. These guys are, they have nothing to, nothing to drink, no water to drink. You know what happens? They, they go to drink the water and it's so bitter they can't hardly stand it. And so you know what Moses does? He prays. He says, God, we need some water. So God says, take that tree. There's a log on the ground. Toss it in the water. The water actually became sweet after he did what God told him to do. There's some really odd things that God tells them to do. But in their obedience, they find that God answers their prayer. God, he, 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 he discovers a, a solution to this problem by just simply saying, I don't know the answer. I don't know why this water is bitter. I don't know where we're going to get good water. But let's ask God. And God provides a bizarre solution, but it's a solution. It's one that works. It's because they decided they would ask God. Over in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, Miriam and Aaron, Moses' brothers and sisters, are rebellious against the Lord. They're rebellious against, against, well, against Moses, who is God's servant. Rebellious, re they're rebelling against what God wants them to do. And so what happens is the Lord strikes Miriam with leprosy. Moses sees that and he is distraught. And so he asked the Lord to take care of that leprosy. And God answers his prayer. Over in 1 Kings chapter 18, prophet Elijah is up on a mountain and he's faced with, with all of these, these people who are, have, have built idols out of, out of man-made objects to worship and they believe in these gods that they have created with their own hands and he's faced with, with, with coming up you know, basically in a challenge between these prophets of Baal and Elijah is standing there and he doesn't know what to do. They say, hey, you know, we're gonna, do, we're gonna make an altar here. We're gonna pour water all over this altar and we're gonna ask God to, call, to, to light that altar on fire. If your God really is listening, if he really is there, then ask him to light that on fire. Well, Elijah doesn't just, I mean, they, 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 they had this little challenge. The prophets of Baal prayed, they danced, they did all their things, and the, all, no, nothing came on fire. Nothing, nothing lit up. Nothing lit up. So Elijah goes, and he actually has people dial, douse it with water. And they pour more water onto it. And they pour more water onto it. And then Elijah prays to God, the Creator, who is listening. And he says, God, for your glory, I know that you can light this altar. And God sends fire from heaven. Chapter earlier than that, 1 Kings 17, Elijah meets a widow. Her son got sick, so she cried out to Elijah. Guess what Elijah did? He prayed. He asked God to make this woman's son well, and God listened, and God answered his prayer. In Judges chapter 16, a one, one, uh, man named Samuel or Samson, Strongest man on the earth, strongest man to ever live. Samson uh, had been captured by the, the Philistine army because he had, uh, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd succumbed to temptation of Delilah, and the Philistine army had captured him. They had gouged out his eyes. They cut his hair, which is what caused him to lose his strength. He'd become their prisoner. And one last time, Samson decided, I just need to go one last time to, to, to defeat this army. And so what does he do? He prays, and God gives him his strength back, even though he didn't deserve it back. But he got it back through praying. Even when he didn't deserve it, he received an answer from God through prayer. 
1 Samuel 1, a woman named Hannah who had no children goes down to the temple. You know what she does? She prays. God eventually gives her a child, a baby named Samuel. 1 Kings 3, Solomon, one of the greatest kings to ever live, one of the wisest and smartest kings to ever live, king of Israel. He doesn't really know how to conduct himself at first, doesn't have all the wisdom that he needs at first, but the way he got wisdom was this. God came to him and he said, he said, he said uh, Solomon, I will give you anything you ask for. I will give you anything that you want, anything at all that you want. Just ask me for it. So Solomon in that moment said, I want wisdom. And he got understanding by asking God for understanding. In Daniel chapter 2, all the prophets and all the people, all of the, the prophets were about to be killed by the king of Babylon because the king of Babylon was having dreams. He couldn't understand them. And so they needed to have somebody that could understand and interpret these dreams. And so Daniel saw what was about to happen. And Daniel prays, Lord, give me the ability to interpret and understand these dreams that this king is having so that we don't die. And God answered his prayer. In the book of 2 Kings chapter 20, King Hezekiah is going to die. The prophet comes to him and he says, turn your face to the wall and pray. You're sick, you're going to die. Pray and ask God to spare your life. Hezekiah did what he was told and he prayed. God gave him 15 more years to live. Are you, you, you starting to get the, the message? I mean, we could go on. We could talk about others. We could look at the entire book of Psalms. We could talk about the prayers that took place there. We could talk about the circumstances of life that people prayed in, why they prayed, how those prayers were answered, how those prayers were listened to, how those prayers sometimes took many years for anyone to ever answer them, how sometimes it seemed like that people were praying and no one was listening, but they continued to pray anyway, and they were persistent, and God eventually comes to them and, 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 and answers their prayer, how it seemed like sometimes Sometimes people were praying for the wrong things and, they got, and that God in, did indeed answer those prayers but didn't answer them exactly the way they thought they would be answered because God answers their prayer according to his glory and what's going to give him more glory because he is good and every answer that he provides is good. We could give all kinds of answers but the, or, or examples but the message is as far as the Bible is concerned, as far as what the, the scripture that we believe in, that we put our faith in, that God has given us to learn and understand and grow and live and pattern our lives toward, the Bible does say and does give us examples that things happen when people pray. Prayer does matter. Let's read a few verses. Jeremiah 33, 3. Just we'll read one from the Old Testament, a couple from the New Testament here. The Lord gives a promise. I just want to read a few of the promises in the Bible here. Call to me, and I will answer you, and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. How will you learn more about this God that you've come to worship? Calling to Him. Just talking to Him. Pray, having a conversation with him. And in doing that, he will reveal more of himself to you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? There isn't a, a lot of ways that I can interpret this than just read it and then ask you, what is he saying? Your Father in heaven, God who loves you, wants to give you things that are good for your life, for your spiritual life, 
for your eternal life. And when you ask for those things, He promises He will give them to you. He knows what you need, Jesus says. He knows your greatest need. The problem is we don't always ask for what we need. We don't ask for the things that are our greatest needs. We don't ask for those things that, 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 that God knows are your greatest needs. And so we wonder, does he really hear us? And I'm telling you, yes, he does. Let's look at one more. Matthew chapter 21, verses 21 and 22. Jesus again says, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. Look at verse 22. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. That's a pretty impressive promise. These things that we've just read are pretty impressive. In fact, I remember hearing about a guy when I was in college who, who had a friend who just, who, I mean, he was brand new. He came to a Christian college, and he, and, and he had just become a Christian like shortly before that, and he decided to change the entire pattern of his life goals. I mean, he had other goals, other, was going to go somewhere else, but decided that God, was, that he, God wanted to use him in ministry. And so he came to the same university that I was at. And, and this, this, this guy who was better friends with him than I was told me that this one time he was talking with him. And it was funny because they were reading the Bible and they read this verse. And he hadn't read all the verses in the Bible yet. He was a new Christian, brand new. And he comes across this verse <laughs> where it says, just believe, just ask. You don't have because you don't ask. Anything you ask for will be given to you. And he said the kid, just like a, like, a little, like a little kid, he goes, man, isn't that great? Why don't we pray more then? <laughs> he actually believed it. When he read it, he actually believed it. He actually believed it was true. You see, the, these are some of the greatest verses in the Bible. These three verses that we just read, from Jeremiah and Matthew 7 and, and Matthew 21, and yet when I, when I read them, we, we maybe have heard them too many times or we don't really truly believe them or something because it doesn't astonish us like it did that young new Christian. Look at, look at John 14, verse 13. Just, just a couple more here. John 14, 13 says, we just studied the Gospel of John not long ago. So I remember reading this verse. I remember doing a sermon on this verse. Jesus says, says this here. He says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now remember, the answers that, that, that God gives to prayer are always going to be answers that glorify the Son, that glorify Him. So remember, if you're praying for something that's going to glorify you, you may not get the answer that you're asking for. But if you're praying for something that Jesus says will glorify God in heaven, that glorifies the Son, God is good. God wants to receive more glory, and He wants you to receive when you ask. And so when you ask these things, He will give. Look at John 15, 7. One last one here. Just one chapter over, he says again, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So here we've gone through the Old Testament really quickly. I just skimmed through and surveyed and botched up a lot of Old Testament stories that you can go back and correct later and look at the, you know, look at, read them all yourself. But the issue there and the idea there is that people, when they wanted something to be done, they prayed. When they needed an answer, they prayed. When they didn't know what to do, they prayed. When they were stuck in a roadblock, they prayed. And here we see in the New Testament that Jesus' teachings are, you know what? If you need something, pray. If you want something, pray. If you're in trouble, pray. If you're sick, pray. If you need to, be, to, to know the answer to something, pray. If you don't know what to do, pray. It's all over the place. Ask and you'll receive. God is good. He wants to give you. Ask, talk to him, pray. Listen, we don't know. We don't realize. We, don't, we wonder why we don't have things. We, we wonder why we don't ever have the, uh, a proper understanding about something. We don't have wisdom about something. We wonder why things are going the way they are, why we're in trouble all the time. How much do you ask? How much do you talk? Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in everything, 
by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Don't worry about if it's right or wrong to ask him this or that. Paul says, listen, in everything, present these things to God. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And so let me ask you this. Let me just give you a challenge here. And then we're going we're gonna to respond in worship and in prayer. And we're going to ask you to just take some time and just talk to God and pray. If you've got something that you need, ask, pray. But let me ask you this as a, as a, as a challenge question. What if... What if you just decided today that you were going to just pray about everything, just like it says in Philippians 4, just everything, that you're just going to be a man or a woman of prayer? I believe your life would be better. I have to believe that. I have to believe that you would not be as anxious I have to believe that when Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, he's not saying, hey, do that first, then pray. I think he's saying, if you were to pray about everything, you wouldn't be anxious about anything. I think it works both ways. I believe that nine out of the ten things that you face during the day, during difficult times in your lives, you'd be able to face it without as much worry, without as much concern, without as much anxiety, because you just pause to pray. God, what do you think about this? I'm not sure what to do here. What do you think? I'm not sure where I should go here. What do you think? I'm not sure what, what's best here. What do you think? And you just talk to him. You just pray. He wants you to pray, to talk to him. You know, one of the things I started doing recently, you know, when somebody comes and they ask me about a problem they don't understand, I, I try to stop and think and say this. What happens when you pray about this? Because it's real easy. I, I'm, I'm sometimes a problem solver. I want to th- immediately think about what the answer is, what we could do, what some kind of strategy is that we can come up with that would help answer and solve this person's problem. And really the truth is, I think the pattern for us, given in most of the wisest people that we read about in the Scripture and the pattern that continues in the New Testament that Jesus talks about is, listen, stop first and say, what happens when you pray about this? And if the answer is, well, I really haven't pr- spent much time in prayer about this. Well, you don't need my advice then. Stop and pray. I mean, let's just suppose that you came today with with a great concern. Let's say you had a great concern that you really need to have some kind of wisdom given to you, that you, you don't know the answer, you don't know the direction that you need to solve this particular problem, or you've got some kind of issue that's going on in your life, and you really need to talk with somebody, okay? You just need to get some advice, some counsel. And so let's just say, okay, we got all of our elders are here this morning, and we'll just take, you know, we got a, there's a room straight back here, the teacher's lounge, it's nice and quiet, we can shut the door. All of our elders will meet with you in that room at the conclusion of this service to help you with your problem. And that might make you feel really good. That's great. We, we, need, we need that, right? We need to talk. I need to sit down and talk with you guys. And you guys need to help me with this problem. But what if I said this? What if? What just what if? And you have to use your imagination here, okay? What if we said, now, what you could do is you could go up in the balcony. And way up there in the corner of the balcony this morning, Jesus Christ himself is actually going to be here. And he'll be waiting for you. If you just go up there, sit down. You could talk to him about whatever it is that's going on. Where would you rather go? You're not going to offend me with the answer. (laughs) I would hope you would all want to go up there and talk to the one who really could help you with your issues. But for some reason, we go find a book. We want to read a book. Someone's written about my problem, right? Let's go to the Christian bookstore. Let's find a book. Take it to the book, take it to the counter, pay for it, start to read it, get all excited. Ask yourself, how much did I pray about this before I went and bought a book? I know this guy, he he makes a lot of wise decisions. He seems to be a good guy. I'll go talk to him first. Well, that's great. You should seek the wise counsel of other believers. But how much time did you spend in prayer about this before you went? Because I guarantee that's going to be, if that person really is wise... That's going to be their first bit of advice. That's going to be the first thing they do. Before I offer you anything, I should pray about this. It is the fabric 
of a person's life who loves Jesus deeply that they always talk with Him. They always converse with Him. They always have conversation and pray and give it to Him and give it to Him. And why? Because we believe that He's listening. We believe that He is involved, that He's not just some man-made idea or God that doesn't have arms or eyes to see or a mouth to talk, but we really believe that He is involved. He is personable. He is involved and He can do and He will do and He does do when we ask. Listen, this was going on in the Old Testament. In Psalms 115, there's a great section of verses in there that talk about how people were creating idols and they were, they were making idols with their hands, a lot like the ones that we talked about in, in uh, 1 Kings 18 with, with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. They were, they were making these idols and, the, and the, the psalmist is writing saying, you know, listen, your idols that you've made have hands, but those hands can't do anything. Those idols that you've made have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have mouths, but they can't talk. It says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel. Feet, but they do not walk. They do not make sound in their throat. Those whom, uh, who make them become like them. And so do all who trust in them. And their answer is, but we have a God who has eyes, and those eyes see the entire earth that He created. We have a God who has arms, and those arms can reach out. We have a God who has hands, and those hands can touch you and your life. We have a God who has a voice, and His voice can speak. We don't serve a silent God who sits back just absent from your life. But you would never know that we have that kind of God unless you talk to Him. Unless you try it. Just pray. And maybe that's why most of us probably would have done the same thing Richard Harvey did in that chemistry class. But he said that on that particular day, Dr. Lee stood up and he began in his speech, the speech that he had been doing for over 15 years. And he said, if there's anyone in here that truly believes that prayer does anything, you believe that there's a God who's listening to you, I invite you to stand up and pray to that God that when I drop this glass flask to this concrete floor, it will not break. And after 15 years of not having a single person challenge him on this particular day, this freshman raised his hand. Dr. Lee says, well, isn't that interesting? We have someone who would like to take this challenge, ladies and gentlemen. And they said there were gasps in the room. People were, 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 were frightened for this young man. And he says, young man, I just want to make sure that you understand this experiment, that you understand what's going on here, that you understand before you begin to step out here and make a fool of yourself, I want you to understand, I'm going to drop this glass flask, but I'm going to give you a chance to pray and ask your God that it won't break. And if it does in fact break, we will be proving that there is nobody listening to you when you offer your prayers. Are you ready to pray? He says, mocking him. The freshman said, yes, sir, I'm ready to pray. Dr. Lee said, okay, everyone, bow your heads while this man prays. But that young man, instead of bowing his hands, instead of bowing his head, he lifted his head to heaven and his hands to heaven. And he said, Father, you know that I've been praying about this since the beginning of the school year. And Father, for your name's sake and for your glory, I would just like to ask you to keep that glass flask from breaking. In Jesus' name, amen. Richard Harvey writes that the moment the young man said amen, 
Dr. Lee dropped the flask. And the way he wrote it was like this. He said, God drew it in. And it landed on the tip of the shoe of Dr. Lee, rolled over onto the concrete floor, and did not break. He said the class gave him <laughs> the old hee-haw, they said. <laughs> And never again in the history of Allegheny College in that class did Dr. Lee ever give what was known as the prayer lecture. And afterwards, that young man, that freshman, had the opportunity to share the, his faith in Christ with dozens of students. But Richard Harvey said while he was doing that, I walked back to my room in silence when I got back to my room, I fell on my knees and tears streamed down my face. And I said, oh, Lord, help me to live like I truly believe in you. This world is full of people looking for a living God, a God who really does hear when they talk, a God who really does see and know what's going on in their lives. And I believe in you. Yet I don't act like I do. I don't live that way. Give me the kind of faith that we saw in that classroom today. Now listen, things like that don't happen all the time. That's not always the way it works, right? That's once in a lifetime like stuff. That's Elijah on the mountain like stuff right there. There's even been urban legends going, that have gone around since then in emails about like, a classroom in USC uh, that did the same thing. This story was actually true. Richard Harvey, the one that Richard Harvey told is the original story that was actually true. It really did happen. But that kind of stuff isn't everyday type stuff. I'm talking about just the everyday events of your life. The kind of prayer lab experiments that we gave you over the last four weeks, these are just the everyday, how you can just determine that you're just gonna live a life talking to God, being with God, being in relationship with God, just praying and thinking about prayer and talking with Him all the time. Just how it works just to live a life of prayer. That's my prayer for you. That's my hope for you. That's my hope and prayer of what each of us will become. Now let me pray for you and we'll respond. Father, um, we, uh, we have so many things that we talk about that we say that we believe. We have, a, we have doctrine, theology, that we align our our understanding to, our lives to, and we, we say, this is what causes me to live a certain way. And, and my prayer this morning, Father, is that if there's anyone here who has never made part of their doctrine or their theology, the truth that prayer, speaking to you, asking you for help, really does work. It really does. It really is meaningful. If that's never been a part of just our practical theology, Lord, I pray that it will become that today. I pray that we'll be convicted today and convinced knowing that this is who you want us to be. I pray that we would take the challenge, just the 52-week challenge every day. We're going to pray. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the difference it makes in the lives of the people in this room. Father, I've already seen the difference in a lot of people's lives. I know we've, we've made, we put challenges out asking people to pray that you would put faces and names of people in our minds of people that we should just simply invite to church. And we've already seen the answers to those prayers in these past few weeks. Just in the past few weeks alone as people have invited friends and neighbors, acquaintances, people they've just met, to just come and see, just to be like Philip did. Hey, I, I just want you to come and see Jesus because we believe that he meets us in this place. So Father, right now we know that you desire to meet with people. We're gonna respond with communion and many will respond through bringing offerings to support the ministry that you've given us to do. 
And Father, we'll just keep singing and asking if there's anyone here that needs to be prayed for, for any reason at all, that they would come. We'll just call this a time of response as we respond to your word that's been preached. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.